Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Trouble and Strife, an adventure audio drama series set in the fantasy world of RuneScape. Written and narrated by Josh Hayes, supported by my wonderful patrons. Episode 4, The Restless Ghost, Part 2. The spirit was still, its outline lashing and flickering, but I knew its eyes were fixed on mine. We both simply stood. The clouds moved overhead slowly, casting patches of shadow around the graveyard, moving like oil on water, as the sun washed from headstone to headstone. The noise of the market in the distance was somehow dulled, as if the graveyard held its own place in space and time. And as we stood facing each other, the ghost spoke again. You can hear me? You can understand me? I slowly nodded. The ghost took a single step forward, awkward, unsure, then another, and slowly but surely it walked right up to me. It was clearer now. I could see the features of its face and make out the clothes it had been wearing in life. It was a man, middle-aged with a soft face. He was wearing a wide-brimmed hat with a feather in one side. As a spirit, he was made of nothing, yet I could see his face clear as day his mouth slightly agape, his eyes filled with shock and hope. He spoke again. How? I reached down and lifted the amulet from my chest, pushing the small skull forward and let the ghost look. He peered at it, twisting his head from side to side, admiring the small fragment of bone, then looked up at me expectantly. You can help me? So much pain. A desperate plea. He can't have been here long and yet he was so desperate to leave. I knew that life could be painful and scary, and often imagined that death must be more so. But the idea of being stuck between, the feeling of fear and pain of death constantly, unable to move on, that must have been horrific. I looked the ghost in the ethereal eyes and replied, I can try. His face changed, not a smile, but a mood. It was as if he was lifted up. I continued, but you'll have to tell me how, what can I do? The ghost turned away from me and walked toward the building it had been beating its fists on, a stone mausoleum. Ivy grew round the base and snaked its vibrant green tendrils up onto the roof. The stonework was immaculate, perfect bricks layered with perfect mortar, and the door a carved mahogany slab, held up with brass hinges, covered in chiselled swirls and symbols. This was the resting place of someone important or rich. The ghost stood in front of the door and raised his corporeal fists and began beating on it. No sound, but within me I felt the impacts, deep thuds, anger, rage and fear. His voice ripping out silently. Can't go! Not complete! Not all there! I approached the ghost and looked over the door. The symbols were intricate and complex, most I'd never seen before, a few I recognised. And as I looked, I saw the bricks were carved the same. Sigils, icons, words in languages I didn't recognise. The whole building was protected. These were magical wards designed to keep evil spirits and demons away. The building was warded against anything unnatural getting in. After admiring the complex stonework, I asked the ghost, What's in here? He turned his head and replied softly, I am, but not complete, can't go on, not all there. I turned back to the door. It was built strong. Bronze edging ran down the frame. Three locks stacked close together and a handle, a flourished swirl of bronze. I didn't imagine I'd be this lucky, but I grasped the handle and twisted. Amazingly, it was unlocked. Not picked or forced, just unlocked. The heavy door opened slowly and silently, and I peered into the crypt. An empty room, bare walls and floor, save for a single feature, a coffin lying on the middle of the floor. Simple wood, a far cry from the craftsmanship of the building itself. With the door open, the ghost went to take a step inside. As his veiled leg passed the doorway, the symbols on the frame and brickwork hissed faintly, 
glowing with a gentle blue tint. Whatever it was, it was powerful magic. But with the door open, the spirit stepped on through and walked up to the coffin. I followed, pulling the door half shut behind me. No windows or gaps in the roof meant the room was covered in darkness, and only the weak light from the doorway fell across the coffin. The ghost paced around and then kneeled down, his wispy fingers stroking the coffin lid. I took a step forward. The ghost looked up at me. Not complete, he whined. Can't go. I kneeled down and wrapped my fingers around the edge of the coffin lid. The wood was weak and splinters stuck out, so being careful, I started to pull. I felt nails loosen, then slide out and clatter to the floor as the lid raised, and eventually I was able to slide it to the side and look inside the coffin. Dust and cloth, clothes bundled neatly in a pile down one end, and then, under the thin layer of grime, a skeleton. Bones laid perfectly out, arms crossed over the chest, the ribs had fallen into a pile, and the joints of fingers and toes were scattered around slightly. But it was complete, except it was missing the skull. A perfect skeleton, with clothes neatly folded and a coffin secured inside a warded building, and yet no skull. I understood. This was the ghost's body. Incomplete. And he couldn't leave this world unless somehow his skull was returned to him. I took a deep breath in. The dust that danced in the beam of sunlight streaming from the door whirling around as I did. Then I turned to the ghost. Where's the skull? He rose slowly, then paced back toward the ajar door. He tried to slide through the gap back to the graveyard, but the symbols hissed and fizzed as he did, and he quickly pulled back, then glanced at me. I walked over and opened the door enough for him to get out. As he did, I stepped back into the fading sun with him, and he pointed toward the swamp. The Tower Warlock. I looked where he was pointing, over the swamp and into the distance. I could just make out the tip of a stone tower, piercing above the swamp and scraping the sky. The ghost continued as he stared at the stone tower. Below the warlock, more of us. His voice seemed to trail off as he muttered inaudibly to himself. I interrupted. The tower. Your skull is in the tower with a warlock? The ghost stopped muttering and turned toward me, then spoke a single, begging word. In desperation, he said, Please. I understood. He couldn't leave his body, but couldn't move on from the world either. I didn't know who he was, why he was buried in such a protected crypt, or who had taken the skull. But in this moment, I didn't need to know. He was in pain, and I was able to help. I hope my good intentions weren't racing ahead of my abilities again, and looking back toward the tip of the stone tower, I knew what I had to do. Wait here, I'll get your skull back. With that, I left the graveyard through the southern gate, and taking a deep breath of acceptable air, I once again made my way into the swamp. I wondered how many times I'd have to do this before I got used to it, wading through bog water, kicking away giant hungry rats, and double checking the vine I was grabbing to steady myself was indeed a vine, and not a spindly, hairy leg of an unnaturally large spider. This was the part of the hero's journey I'd avoided, focusing on the idea of gleaming castles and pristine taverns. I'd quite avoided the idea of crawling on my hands and knees through a mosquito-infested, rotten bog, and yet here I was. I followed the same path I'd taken to reach Father Ernie's hut, and made it through quicker than last time, emerging from the overgrowth with another fresh layer of oily sheen and swamp mud riding up my boots and trousers, almost up to my knees. I picked up a fallen branch from the damp ground and scraped off what mud I could before walking on. I could see Father Ernie's hut, and then to the west, the stone tower. It stood, imposing and powerful, as if watching over the land. And as I walked closer to it, I could see I was reaching the edge of the land, and the water spread out in front of me. The tower was built on an island, connected to the mainland by a vast bridge of stone and steel, 
the support arches erupting from the water, then diving back below. Moss covered the brickwork where the water had lapped against it, and the steel supports coated in a fine layer of brine. The bridge was a single, straight line, and was north of where I had emerged. So I walked along, following the water's edge. The thick Lumbridge swamp on my right, the vast ocean and stone tower bridge on my left. Ahead of me was a thin forest, which looked much healthier than the swamp I'd been crawling through. As I made my way along to the bridge entrance, I saw a small campfire ahead and to the right, and sat around it a small party of people, a man wearing plate armour, a woman clad in green-looking leather, and a blue-robed figure carrying a long, slender staff. They were chatting away, and as I walked on by, they saw me and raised a friendly hand in a wave. I waved back, and they returned to their conversation. I'd managed to walk far enough north that the land curved around and I could walk onto the great stone bridge. It was wide enough to fit two carriages side by side, and guardrails as tall as a person ran along either side made of stone and metal. Every few feet were wooden supply crates or sacks filled with goods. I could see grain spilling out of one, potatoes from another. I walked along the bridge toward the tower. The stones worn smooth, with deep grooves where the wheels of carts would trundle through. This bridge was ancient. Stones this thick take years to wear away, and yet the path was almost smooth. The walk was a simple straight line, and only ten minutes long, but gazing at the magnificent tower ahead of me made it worth it. The sheer size of the thing, the walls made of rounded bricks, some held together with mortar, some nailed with metal banding. Other parts of it seemed to be held up with a faint purple glow, magical energy holding it in place. I reached the end of the bridge and stepped onto the island where the tower stood. Around the island, tall wooden torches driven into the ground burning brightly. The grass was tidy and clean, and a stone fountain had water trickling down it. A single round boulder floating above it, levitating over, and the water seemed to wash over it constantly, as if appearing from nowhere and then falling to the pool below. The tower itself dominated the small island, the foundations almost reaching the water's edge as it curved around, and outside on the island, several people stood around, some walking, some picking flowers from the ground, some stood in groups chatting, a few gazing to the ocean beyond. All of them wore bright blue robes and blue capes, and a few had blue pointed hats, all of them clean and vibrant. One of them saw me. He was tending to the leaves of a small tree growing by the water, and with a smile he walked over and greeted me. Hello there, welcome to the wizard's tower, how can I help? I wasn't sure how to start this conversation. I didn't know if there was a certain etiquette in this land, or if wizards had any strange customs or habits I had to follow. I figured honesty was the best policy, so replied, Hello, my name is Strife, and I'm looking for a warlock. The wizard slowed his walk toward me, still moving, but much more cautious, his face puzzled. Afraid you're in the wrong place, friend, no warlocks here. His reply sounded defensive, almost insulted. Maybe I'd broken a rule I wasn't aware of, so I tried again. Well, who could I speak to that would know anything about a warlock being here? The wizard had stopped walking and was eyeing me with suspicion. If you want to talk about warlocks, I suggest you go inside and talk to Cedrador. He knows more than I do and I don't feel comfortable talking about them. With that, the road man quickly returned to tending the tree, glancing at me occasionally with disgust. I'd done something wrong, I just didn't know what yet. But he told me who I had to talk to, so I was one step closer. I walked toward the Grand Tower and through the open double doors at the front. The base of the tower opened into a grand entrance hallway. The round shape of the tower meant all the outer walls had a smooth curve to them. The floor was covered in an ornate blue rug, with the four-pointed star of Saradomin sewn into it in a brilliant white, gold tassels on each corner. The room, despite being large, was otherwise bare. A few candlesticks dotted around and wooden torches fastened to the wall with strips of bronze and two other doors in the distance, to my left and right. With no one inside, I walked through the hallway and took the door on my left. It opened into a great library, 
rows and rows of deep wooden bookshelves stacked to the ceiling, each of them overflowing with old books, thin, flimsy volumes and thick, dense tomes, some spilling onto the floor with pages scatters, others stacked neatly by the ends of each shelf. Between the rows of bookshelves were wooden tables, lined up neatly with wizards sat at them, studying and reading, some standing and gesturing wildly as they muttered under their breath. Others stood in groups of four or five, all staring intensely at unfolded scrolls and parchments. As I stood in the doorway, a young girl carrying a stack of books walked past me. Her arms were stretched low and fingers curled tightly around the bottom book and the stack reached up past her nose. She was leaning back slightly and balancing the precarious stack of books against herself as she walked. I quickly asked, excuse me, I'm looking for Cedrador. She turned abruptly and the stack almost fell, but she managed to keep control and replied, back into the hallway, take the other door and go down the ladder. He works in the basement. With that, she returned to pacing around, picking up more books and adding them to the awkwardly tall stack. I turned back toward the hallway and walked over to the other door. The tower was oddly laid out. I guess wizards didn't spend too much time researching architecture. Making my way through the other door, I walked into a small stairwell with a tight spiral staircase in the corner leading to the upper floors and opposite it, a hole cut into the floor with a strong wooden ladder leading down into the darkness. I went to the ladder, sat on the floor, swung myself onto it and climbed down. The bottom steps of the ladder met with a solid dirt floor, no stone or carpet. The walls were cheap brick with wooden support beams every few paces holding them back. I'd hopped off the ladder and was at the end of a corridor, well lit and not too cool, but a world apart from the grand open space above me. I walked along, only one direction to head in, and the flickering light from the torches lighting the way easily enough. At the end of the corridor it turned right, and following it around I could see it stretched far into the distance, with small crumbled walls, piles of dusty bricks stacked along the way. On my right was an open wooden door, and I peered inside. It was a bedroom, large and well furnished, a grand four-poster bed with wooden frames and red bedsheets, bookshelves lining the brick walls and an oak dining table already set with plates and cutlery. Beside the table there were shelves stocked with sacks and jars and sat on one of the chairs was another blue-robed man, older than the others, reading a book. He glanced up, straw-coloured hair falling over his face and a beard that reached down below his chest. His voice was strong despite his apparent age. Can I help you? I took a step inside and replied, I'm looking for Cedrador. The man closed the book he was reading and twisted the chair to face me and replied, You've found him. How can I help you? I walked forward some more. Cedrador, my name is Strife and I'd like to ask you about a warlock that lives here. With those words, Cedrador flinched before replying, Okay, which one of them put you up to this? Come on, come on, out with it, give me a name, who was it? I had spoken to two wizards in my life and somehow offended both of them. I wasn't skilled or trained in the magical arts and I knew one day a conversation like this would end very badly for me, so I just had to be as direct as I could. No one, I'm here because a spirit sent me here. Cedrador hesitated, then motioned for me to take a seat on the chair beside him. I walked over, dropped my pack onto the floor, and sat down. Cedrador leaned back on his chair casually. Why don't you explain why you're here, Strife? Then I'll see what we can do to help you. Explaining everything would be easy, but explaining everything in such a way as to leave out Father Eric blaming himself, that would be trickier. I tried my best. I explained about the ghost being seen in the graveyard, about Ernie giving me the amulet, about the spirit showing me the coffin with no skull, and finally, about how I'd been led here to find a warlock. All the time, Cedrador was nodding along. When I'd finished, he took a moment and thought before replying. Strife, you have come to the wizard's tower. He paused for effect before carrying on. Now you seek a warlock, not a wizard, and they are not the same thing. 
He stood up from the chair and began to pace around the room, reading the titles on spines of various books stacked on the shelves as he did. Some people are born with magical talents, a gift for the arcane, and we call these people sorcerers. He picked up a book from the shelf and slowly slid it into his hand. Others are not as lucky and must spend their whole life studying the mystical arts and develop their abilities through patience and practice. These people we know as wizards. He began walking back toward the table, carrying the book. And some people are lazy and greedy and want more power than one person should have. So they make deals with devils and demons and entities and corrupt themselves in the pursuit of power. And these people... He dropped the heavy book onto the table with a thud. It landed in front of me and was covered with paintings of skulls. These people we call warlocks. With that, he sat back down and glared at me. He nodded very slightly toward the book. I reached down and opened it. The cover had a single large design of a skull surrounded by many smaller ones, all broken, cracked in different ways. And each page listed spells and incantations that required grisly elements, parts of people, animals, from blood to bone, or worse. It made for grim reading. As I read, Cedridor spoke more. There are no warlocks in this tower. I closed the book, its pages shutting with a dull thud, and simply sat there. It seemed I had reached a dead end. However, Cedridor said, your missing skull story does concern me. He stood up and walked over to the door, then beckoned me to follow. I gathered my pack and went after him. He'd left the room and was walking further down the brick corridor. As I caught up, he spoke more. Two nights ago, someone forced their way into a locked room down here. Cedridor turned left through an open doorway, and I followed. We walked into another bedroom, larger than the first, another bed, dining table, and bookshelves, but fewer lit torches, leaving pools of shadow lying around. And then, I saw the room had a wrought iron fence running down the middle of it, barring off half the room. As I walked closer, I could see through the fence, into the room beyond. Tables, chairs, some broken and some not, a brown rug covered the floor. Dust, dirt and debris scattered everywhere. And at one end of the barred off room, an altar made of dark stone and dust. On it, two candlesticks, unlit, and more objects I couldn't quite make out. Cedridor walked down the length of the metal fence to a gate at one end and reached toward a padlock hanging from the gate lock. It was warped and twisted. It had been forced open. He spoke again. Someone broke into this room. He slid the broken padlock from the bar and clicked open the gate, walking into the darkened room. I followed and asked, what did they take? Cedridor scoffed as he walked toward the altar at the end and replied, ha, they didn't take anything. He walked up to the altar and as I walked up by his side, I could make out the other objects that covered it. They were bones. It's what they left that concerns me. A femur, a pile of finger and toe joints, a skull, and many more, each of them different sizes. I took in the grisly sight, and as I was trying to process it, Cedridor spoke. There has not been a warlock in this tower for centuries. Until now. He was staring at the macabre pile of human remains on the altar, his eyes darting from piece to piece. My eyes had slowly adjusted to the dim light, and I was able to make out more details. The corpse of a rat lying on the dirt floor, the rotten leg of a smashed chair, and the altar, along with playing host to a pile of broken bones, had a slight clearing in the middle, save for a dried pool of blood in the shape of a handprint. Cedridor continued. Someone 
somewhere made a deal. And this was the cost. A blasphemous, disgusting, cruel act committed right here, under our noses. Graves desecrated. He paused for an angry breath and then looked at me. And the worst thing our scholars discovered is all these bones are from different people. Cedridor returned his stern gaze to the pile on the altar. I am afraid your ghost is not the only spirit wailing in pain right now, Strife. I thought about those words and looked at the pile of bones. Whoever had made a deal, and whatever it had made that deal with, this was barbaric. As I contemplated the weight of it, Cedridor reached over and picked up the skull. But I feel we have the chance to make part of it right. He lifted the skull and passed it carefully over to me. I took it, then placed it slowly, respectfully, into my pack and nodded at Cedridor. I reassured him, I'll make sure this gets back to the tomb and is laid to rest with the rest of the body. Thank you. With that, I turned around and took a step toward the gate of the fence. And as I did, I felt a tug on my wrist, pressure, something caught. I looked down and saw bony fingers wrapped around my arm. And as I slowly lifted my gaze, the bones on the altar started to shake and rattle, clamping themselves together, fusing into a full skeleton. And with a firm grasp on my arm, the bones violently sat up and reached toward my face with the other undead hand. I yanked my wrist away hard and stumbled back away from the altar, bumping into the tables and chairs as I did. Cedridor jumped back and quickly joined me. He stared at the skeletal figure as it jerked and thrashed violently and clawed its way off the altar and started moving toward us, its bones snapping and contorting as it went. Strife, run! Cedridor bellowed. I could feel the skull in my pack was shaking, rolling around, trying to return to its horrific body. I turned about and ran toward the gate, tripping on piles of wood and debris as I went. The skeleton reached Cedridor and was clawing at his face with gnarled, bony fingers. The old wizard reached up and grabbed the skeleton by the ribs and hurled it against the wall. For an old man, he was surprisingly strong, and I watched as the mass of animated bone flew through the air and crashed against the brickwork and shattered into pieces, each bone falling and clattering to the floor. Then... No sooner than it had broke, the horrible scraping sound again, and the mass reformed. The bones clicked horribly back together, except this time, the human shape was gone. It was a monster. Bones fused to bones, ribs through fingers, and thin, trailing tendrils of toes and teeth fused hanging down together. It reached a long mass of bone to the ceiling and pierced the bricks, causing dust to shower down onto Cedridor. Then, as it reached a curved arm forward and with a violent snap, it sheared its own arm in two, snapping the bone to a razor point and lunged toward the old wizard. Cedridor dived out the way, rolling across the tabletop and picking up a broken chair just in time to deflect the deadly stab. I rushed to the gate and flung it open, back through the bedroom and into the brick corridor and screamed, Help! Somebody help us! Cedridor was dodging back and forth as the animated pile of bones was forming and reforming, each shape more vile than the last. Every time it missed a strike, it shattered into more pieces, aging dust filling the air and shards of bone fusing together into deadly spikes and hooks. I ran back through the bedroom and through the gate. I had to help, but I didn't know how. The skull in my pack was still shaking and flailing around, wanting to return to its deadly host. I drew my sword and thrust my arm into the grip of my wooden shield. No, it was broken! Oh, I hadn't bothered to get it fixed since I'd fallen down a few days ago. It was useless. I threw the broken shield onto the pile of other broken things in the room and grabbed my sword with both hands. Rushing toward the creature, I brought the blade up high and down hard onto a bony arm. The blade cut into it, but didn't cut through. It was stuck, wedged deep into the bone. As the creature thrashed around, bones snapping and dropping, it wrenched its arm away from me and with it, my sword slipped from my grip and flew through into the dark corner of the room. 
I could see Cedvador was tiring as the creature kept lashing and stabbing toward him. His dodges were slowing. The mass of bones thrust a thin slither toward him and it sliced his robe. A small tear, then another. The attacks were coming thick and fast and shards of bones were whipping toward him from the nightmarish mass. Cedrador was focused, staring intently at his foe, dodging, weaving around the razor bone. He moved like a man 30 years younger, walking across the uneven floor and stepping from table to chair to ground as he went. He started panting for breath. And then I heard a young girl's voice cry from the gateway. Crumble undead! And a flash. The room was lit in a dazzling blue and a solid bolt of energy flew past me, past Cedrador, and crashed into the mass of bone. It smothered it, and then the creature pulled back, thrashed around, and started melting, the bone dripping down onto the floor, splitting and cracking, flaking apart, until finally it fell to the floor in a silent pile of dust. Cedrador caught his breath, panting heavily and leaning on the damaged table. I looked over to the other wizard. I recognised her. It was the girl carrying books from earlier. She stood, arm outstretched, her face a mix of shock and focus. Whatever she'd done, it had worked. Cedridor straightened himself out and dusted off his robe and hat. He turned to face us both. Strife, return that skull to its rightful place now. He looked at the girl. You're not meant to be down here. The young wizard lowered her arm and stood meekly back, before Cedridor added, But good shot. I looked around for my sword and saw it had landed in the pile of melted bone. The blade was chipped and warped. It was unusable. I'd have to replace it. I left the altar room, walked back through the bedroom, and turned to the young wizard as I passed, and said, Thank you. She smiled, and offered a polite, You're welcome, as I made my way back down the long corridor, up the ladder, and out of the wizard's tower. I walked back along the expansive stone bridge from the tower to the mainland. The skull in my pack had stopped thrashing around. Whatever magic had animated it was gone. I crossed the bridge, turned right, and walked back past the party of adventurers once more. Another wave, and then I started to crawl back through the swamp. I was almost getting used to this by now. The smell wasn't bothering me as much, and even the oily mess dripping from the leaves didn't irritate me as it did before. With careful steps and slow crawling, I pushed back through the swamp and finally stepped out onto the solid ground of the other side. Emerging from the swamp, the familiar sight of the river Lom and the graveyard in the distance, I paced with purpose over and through the gates of the graveyard, past the rows of headstones and inside the intricate mausoleum. The spirit was sat in the corner, back not quite touching the wall, knees pulled up to his chin and head buried in them. I walked to the coffin in the centre of the floor, reached into my pack, and lifted out the skull. The spirit glanced up and saw me. His eyes opened wide as I placed the skull back inside the coffin carefully. His body started to flicker and fade as wisps of grey light pulled away into nothingness. His voice carried a faint thank. Before he could finish speaking, he was gone. I picked the lid of the coffin up and took one final look at the bones inside. They seemed complete. Placing the lid back over them, I pushed it down and then walked out the ornate door, shutting it behind me, twisting the handle hard. The graveyard seemed lighter. The sun was still hidden by clouds and the crows still cawed in the distance, but the air felt clearer. I walked through between the headstones and out the eastern gate toward the southern Lumbridge shops. The market was still busy. I guess in a small fishing town there really was nothing to do but barter and trade. Walking past the shops and people, I journeyed toward the church and, with a smile, I walked inside. Father Eric was sat on a pew facing the front altar, head bowed forwards, hands clasped together in prayer. I softly walked over and sat down beside him. He raised his head and muttered, Amen, before facing me. I smiled and simply said, It's done. Father Eric let out a long sigh and stared at the ground before softly speaking. Thank you, Strife. A long pause before he continued. 
I can't imagine what you must think of me. A father who can't even save a single soul. I lifted my head and looked out the stained glass window toward the graveyard and the mausoleum. Then down toward the amulet Father Ernie had given me. I remembered how happy a simple hello had made him. From wild loneliness to tears of joy. I looked back at Father Eric and said, No. You saved two. Thank you for listening to episode four of Trouble and Strife, a RuneScape audio drama. I hope you're enjoying the adventure. The ambient music in this episode was composed by Michael Gelfi. Links to his channel are below. If you'd like to hear more audio drama adventures, you can support me on Patreon by clicking the link in the description or find me at patreon.com forward slash Josh Strife Hayes. Thank you for your time and have a great day.